All right, so this is the second lecture for chapter 28. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about water-soluble vitamins. So we've broken it down into fat-soluble vitamins, which we talked about in the last lecture, and then water-soluble vitamins, which we'll talk about in this lecture. So first, vitamin B1, also known as thiamine. It's an important cofactor for reactions within the citric acid cycle. We'll go over this on the next slide. The pentose phosphate pathway, specifically the trans ketolase enzyme, which is one of the first enzymes in the non-oxidative portion of the pathway, and then amino acid metabolism, which specifically would be branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase, which is responsible for breaking down branch chain amino acids. As far as its function, it composes the thiamine pyrophosphate cofactor, which is again used for multiple cellular respiration enzymes, and those are listed here. So here's the citric acid cycle again. So you remember pyruvate dehydrogenase, this first reaction here that converts pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, that requires B1 or thiamine. And then over here, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, the fifth enzyme here, this also requires B1 or thiamine, which converts alpha-ketoglutarate into succinyl-CoA. And the importance of this is certainly this could show up on an exam that these reactions require thiamine. The other thing, though, is if you have a thiamine deficiency, you can't efficiently carry out the citric acid cycle because these enzymes require it. And so you're going to have a disconnect between glycolysis and the electron transport chain, and so you're going to significantly decrease the amount of ATP you can produce. And that's kind of the global or overview importance of thiamine deficiency. So specifically, it results in the inability to break down glucose, which yields a decrease in ATP production. It's commonly caused by chronic alcoholism and then poor nutrition because vitamin B1, it's not produced in the body, so we have to ingest it in the diet. And so if someone is having poor nutrition, they're not going to be consuming it along with other vitamins. The thing about alcoholism is that alcohol actually has two effects that have been studied for thiamine. So number one, ethanol interferes with thiamine absorption. in the GI tract. So that's one cause. And then it also interferes with storage in the liver. So it interferes with the ability to, to take it up and then also store it. And so again, that's why you commonly will see this in chronic alcoholics. The clinical syndromes of B1 deficiency are beriberi and Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. So there's dry beriberi and wet beriberi. So dry beriberi affects the peripheral nerves specifically. And because of that, these, these patients are going to present with symptoms of neuropathy and then muscle wasting or muscle weakness. Then there's wet beriberi, which affects the cardiovascular system. So you'll see dilated cardiomyopathy, which can result in high output cardiac failure. And then you can develop fluid, fluid buildup or edema, and hence the name wet. So that's how you can keep these straight. Just remember wet, cardiovascular system responsible for mo moving fluid, and also you have fluid buildup in wet beriberi. Then you have wernicke korsakoff syndrome. So this is a syndrome commonly seen in alcoholics, and it's commonly, present, it's commonly a clinical diagnosis, not necessarily by measuring vitamin B levels on the labs or anything, although these patients definitely would have decreased B1 levels on their labs. It's going to be much more of a clinical diagnosis. And the way you see that is that these patients will have confusion, ataxia, nystagmus on physical exam, personality or behavioral changes. They can be agitated. And then also they may be making things up, telling you tall tales, things that don't really make any sense, which would be called confabulation and then also memory loss. And that stems from that this would result in damage of the mammillary bodies and the medial dorsal nucleus of the thalamus, which are both structures in the brain that contribute towards memory. Again, the diagnosis is usually made clinically in the real world. You could also make a biochemical diagnosis by administering B1 and then following for an increase in transketolase activity, that enzyme in the pentose phosphate pathway. So again, the, the diagnosis in the real world is clinical, and then obviously the way you treat it is you supplement with thiamine. So the next vitamin, vitamin B2, also known as riboflavin, its function, it's a component of FAD. And then as you can see in the diagram down here, it's actually used in the synthesis of niacin from tryptophan. 
And then it's also used as a cofactor for the TCA cycle enzyme succinate dehydrogenase, as we'll show here on this slide. So if you come over here to this reaction right here, when you convert succinate into fumarate, that enzyme succinate dehydrogenase requires vitamin B2 as a cofactor, and you actually produce an FADH2 from that reaction. So clinically, the deficiency of vitamin B2 results in chelosis and then somatotitis, which is essentially inflammation of the mucous membranes around the mouth and the lips, and then also specifically the angles of the mouth, which is chelosis. So you'll see clinically, you'll see cracking and scaling of the lips and the mouth edges. You can also see a thickened, beefy red tongue, increased pathological vascularization of the cornea. The other thing you can see is what's called a normocytic anemia. So they have a low red blood cell count, but the size of the cells on the peripheral blood smear are normal. This is in contrast to, as we'll talk about later, vitamin B9 or vitamin B12 deficiency, which also result in anemia, but they result in what's called a megaloblastic anemia, where again, you have a decreased number of red blood cells, but in those deficiencies, the anemia results in larger than normal red blood cells. And then obviously the way you treat this is you want to supplement with vitamin B2, and typically you would give a multivitamin to help with that. So vitamin B3, it's also known as niacin, and it's made from tryptophan. And as we mentioned previously, it actually requires two other B vitamins, B2 and B6. And so you can see your tryptophan using these as cofactors gets converted into niacin. Functionally, it's a component of NAD+, which makes it very, very important because as you saw in Unit 3, NAD+, is a critical component in so many different metabolic reactions throughout the body. It also has a therapeutic effect where it lowers VLDL and increases HDL. And as a result of that, it can actually be used clinically to treat dyslipidemias. And sometimes it's even used in combination with statins as well. So when you have a deficiency of vitamin B3, this is very rare in developed countries, but more commonly seen in third world countries where malnutrition is such a serious problem because that's usually the cause of it. Again, also you can see it in very severe chronic alcoholics. You're kind of seeing a theme here where chronic alcoholism results in significant vitamin deficiencies. So whenever a severe alcoholic comes into the hospital, they're always checked for vitamin deficiencies and hopefully to re the treatment involves repleting those. Anyways, I digress. Pe Pe Pellagra is the actual clinical syndrome of vitamin B3 deficiency, and it's characterized by a number of clinical features. One of those would be skin sensitivity, to sunlight. And what can happen is, is that the skin can then, as it gets exposed to sunlight, it can ex develop peeling, redness, scaling, and then thickening. So you can see that you know, in your hands and arms and other sun exposed areas of the skin. You can see a, a variety of symptoms. You can also see diarrhea, dermatitis, necklace rash, that's very characteristic. And then you can also see dementia. Since niacin requires tryptophan to be synthesized, it, this condition, Pellagra, can also be caused by anything that causes tryptophan deficiency, such as Hartnup's disease and carcinoid syndrome. When you have an excess of niacin, you can see flushing both in the face and in the body, hyperglycemia, and then hyperuricemia. And since this flushing is mediated by prostaglandins, it can be treated with aspirin. Vitamin B5, also known as pantothenic acid, is primarily used in fatty acid metabolism and then used by a couple reactions in the citric acid cycle. It's a major component of coenzyme A, or CoA for short, thus making it very necessary for fatty acid transfers and synthesis. Specifically, it's used by the enzyme fatty acid synthase and then fatty acyl CoA synthetase. And then in the citric acid cycle, like vitamin B1, it's used by pyruvate dehydrogenase in the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl CoA. And then it's also used by alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase in the conversion of alpha-ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA. Clinically, if you have a deficiency of vitamin B5, you're going to see enteritis, which is just inflammation of the intestines, alopecia, which is hair loss, dermatitis, inflammation of the skin, and then loss of adrenal function. And all of these conditions are a direct result of the inability to properly make the necessary fatty acids because you're not able to create CoA. So vitamin B6, also known as paradoxine, is used in a number of different pathways and for the synthesis of a number of different molecules in the body. 
It's used in protein degradation, heme synthesis, and then neurotransmitter synthesis. Specifically, it helps in the formation of heme as a cofactor for ALA synthase, formation of niacin, histamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, GABA, dopamine, and cystothionine. You can see that down here with this figure here. So here's B6 all along here, used for all of these different molecules. And even down here for dopamine from DOPA. It's a cofactor for transamination and amino transferase reactions, which are critical for amino acid metabolism, as we talked about in Unit 3. And it's also a cofactor for glycogen phosphorylase, which is critical for glycogen metabolism. Deficiency of vitamin B6 can be caused by isoniazide therapy, which is an antibiotic used for tuberculosis. It's a pretty frequent test question, actually. And then clinically, you can see a variety of symptoms because B6, as we showed on the previous slide, is used in a, across a number of different reactions that are critical for the body to function. Specifically, you can see neurological symptoms because of the neurotransmitter problems that can result from vitamin B6 deficiency and the deficiency of certain neurotransmitters. So you can see convulsions, neuropathy. You can see sideroblastic anemia due to defective heme synthesis because it's a critical cofactor for ALA synthase. And then you can also see glossitis, chelosis, dermatitis, which are similar to the other B-complex vitamin deficiencies. Vitamin B7, also known as biotin, it's an important cofactor for reactions involved in gluconeogenesis and fatty acid synthesis. Specifically, it's an essential cofactor for carboxylation reactions. And then the specific enzymes it's involved in is pyruvate carboxylase, which is involved in gluconeogenesis, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, and propanyl CoA carboxylase, which are both involved in fatty acid synthesis. So when you have a deficiency of biotin, the clinical features you'll see are alopecia, enteritis, muscle pain, and dermatitis. And this is because the enzymes we listed on the previous slide are necessary for fatty acids. It can also be caused by ingesting too many egg whites because avidin binds to biotin and then thus prevents it from being used in those reactions. So vitamin B9, also known as folate, it's stored in the liver for three to five months. And then in the diet, it's found in spinach and other leafy green vegetables. It's absorbed in the second part of the small intestines called the jejunum. So if you recall from your anatomy, the duodenum is the first part. Then you have the jejunum as the, sec the second part. And then you have the ileum as the last part. So it's absorbed here in the jejunum. Sometimes that's a test question. Pathways that it's particularly involved in is purine and pyrimidine synthesis. Remember, we talked about this in the first lecture in Unit 1. And so the function really is it's, an, it's necessary for one-carbon reactions mediated by thymidylate synthase, which is an enzyme involved in these processes. And so the overall function is it serves as a requirement, as a cofactor for reactions involved in the synthesis of DNA and RNA. So clinically, with B9 folate deficiency, it's common with malnutrition, and then obviously with chronic severe alcoholics, as we've been talking about, pregnant women actually require a higher baseline level of folate to actually support neural tube development, so development of the nervous system within the fetus. And so what's done is you supplement pregnant women with folic acid. You can also see folate deficiency caused by certain drugs, such as methotrexate, sulfa drugs, and phenytoin. Some clinical features of folate deficiency. So first, you're going to see what's called a macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. So you're going to see decreased count of red blood cells, but the red blood cells are going to be larger than normal. So you'll have, you know, your normal size like this, then on a smear for macrocytic anemia, they're going to be much larger. And what you have is the MCV on the labs is actually going to be greater than 100. Normal is 80 to 100. And then when you get below 80, that's what's called microcytic. And that's typically iron deficiency anemia. So with this, with B9 and then also with B12 deficiency, you'll see macrocytic, which is greater than 100. Also on the smear, you can see hypersegmented polymorphonuclear neutrophils. And if you look at this peripheral smear down here, this is an image you want to become familiar with because you could definitely see it on an exam. These are both examples of hypersegmented neutrophils, and you can see that within here. Also, you're going to see increased levels of homocysteine in the blood. Now, and you'll also see that in B12, and we'll talk about that in a second here. But the diff one difference between B9 deficiency and B12 deficiency is in B9, you're going to have normal levels of methylmalonic acid. For, and the reason for that is B12 is required for conversion of methylmalonic acid into succinyl-CoA eventually. And so if you have 
just an isolated B9 deficiency, but normal levels of B12, you can still convert methylmalonic acid into succinyl-CoA. However, for homocysteine, remember we went over this diagram when we went over methionine metabolism in unit three. So you have methionine here, you have homocysteine here. So you go through this whole process, but to get convert homocysteine into methionine, first you need B12, as you can see here, but then you also need tetrahydrofolate, a derivative of folate, so if you have decreased folate or decreased B12, and obviously if you have decreased levels of both, you can't carry out this reaction. So what's going to happen is, is you're going to have buildup of homocysteine in both either B9 or isolated B12 deficiency. And then what happens with a buildup in homocysteine is you'll have homocysteinemia, which puts patients at risk for atherosclerosis, and then also a greater tendency to clot, so they're at risk for developing deep vein thrombosis or DVT. You can also see glossitis and dermatitis as you do with the other B-complex vitamin deficiencies we've talked about. So overall, the symptoms, the lab value is very similar to B12 deficiency, but there's no neurological symptoms seen in B9 deficiency. So vitamin B12, cobalamin, it's stored in the liver for three to four years, so you can have it stored for a very long time. It's found in the diet containing animals, so meat. It's absorbed in the third part of the intestine known as the ileum, so again, you have the duodenum the jejunum, which is where B9 is absorbed, and then you have the ileum, which is the last part, which is where B12 is absorbed. Pathways it's involved with are odd carbon fatty acid synthesis and methionine synthesis, and within those pathways, it's a necessary cofactor for methionine synthase and then methylmalonyl CoA mutase. So B12 deficiency, it has a number of different causes. So one is diphylobothrium latum parasite, which is a parasitic infection. So that can lead to B12 deficiency malabsorption syndromes because it's absorbed in the ileum of the intestines. So if you have enteritis, Crohn's disease, celiac tropical sprue, or chronic pancreatitis, so any type of disease that can lead to malabsorption can cause B12 deficiency. And then loss of intrinsic factor, we'll talk about that in a second here, and then not enough animal product intake, so like a vegan diet where you're not really eating any meat over a long period of time can also result in potentially B12 deficiency. So to explain intrinsic factor, let's go to the whiteboard here. Draw someone's head right here. Maybe I'll draw their neck like this. So in the oral cavity here, what you have is, is a glycoprotein called transcobalamin 1. And this is secreted by the salivary glands. And we'll call this TI for short, because then what you're going to have is so TI, transcobalamin 1, will bind B12 within the oral cavity. And the purpose for that is that it'll travel down the esophagus and then into the stomach. And so it'll travel here into the, into the stomach. And remember, there's a lot of acid in the stomach. So the purpose of transcobalamin 1 is protection from stomach acid. So then it gets into here, into the GI, then it enters from the stomach, it enters into the GI tract. So then first you're in the duodenum here, and then we'll go over here to the ileum, which will be over here, the terminal part. And normally, the, you know, obviously the small intestines would be, you know, very windy and everything throughout the abdomen, but this is just a simplistic diagram. So from the stomach, you'll go to the duodenum, which is where pancreatic enzymes are released. So you have pancreatic enzymes that release. And what they do is they cause... B12 to disassociate from transcobalamin 1. So then you have B12 floating out here. And then what you'll have is the parietal cells of the stomach, they secrete intrinsic factor, or IF. So they secrete intrinsic factor, which then makes its way into the duodenum and into the intestine. And then here, B12 within the, within the intestine will bind to intrinsic factor which then allows it to then travel to the ileum and then be absorbed across the epithelium of the ileum. 
B12 cannot be absorbed without intrinsic factor. So even if you have a normal level of B12 intake, if you don't have intrinsic factor, then you're not going to be able to absorb B12. And so there's actually a disease called pernicious anemia. And what that leads to is actually antibodies that will then tra target intrinsic factor, or they could target the parietal cells of the stomach and cause decreased intrinsic factor. And then as a result of that, if you don't have intrinsic factor, then B12 will just float through the intestines and not be absorbed. So it's kind of an indirect way of causing B12 deficiency. Because although you have a normal intake, you just can't get it absorbed. And so again, we talked about pernicious anemia. And then the reason it's called pernicious anemia is then if you don't have, if you lead to B12 deficiency, you're obviously going to develop anemia as part of B12 deficiency, which we'll talk about in a second here. The other thing that can cause this loss of intrinsic factor is gastric resection or bypass surgery. So if you take off the part of the stomach that's producing intrinsic factor, then that can also lead to loss of intrinsic factor and then obviously malabsorption of B12. So some clinical features of B12 deficiency, again, just like with B9 deficiency, you'll see macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. You'll see these hypersegmented polymorphonuclear neutrophils that we see here in, these, in this peripheral smear again. The other thing you'll also see like in B9 is you'll see increased homocysteine levels in the blood. The difference though is you'll see increased levels of methylmalonic acid levels. So the story with that is, is that so we'll have methylmalonic acid. It gets converted into methylmalonyl-CoA. And then methylmalonyl-CoA gets converted into succinyl-CoA. And this is carried out by an enzyme called methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. And this enzyme requires, as we mentioned before, B12 as a cofactor. So in B9 deficiency, sure, you can't carry out this conversion of homocysteine to methionine. You can't carry it out, so then you have increased levels of homocysteine. Same thing if you're missing B12. You can't carry out conversion of homocysteine to methionine. So again, you're going to have this increased levels of homocysteine. The difference is, is that in isolated B9 deficiency, you're going to still have B12 available to carry out this reaction. But in a B12 deficiency, you can't carry out homocysteine to methionine, and then you also can't carry out the conversion of methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA. So then you're going to have a backup here, and you're going to have a buildup of methylmalonic acid. And so that's, on labs at least, that's a main difference between B12 and B9 deficiency. You're also going to see clinically glossitis and dermatitis as you deal with, with these other B-complex vitamin deficiencies. And then lastly here, Although the, sim the symptoms of B9 deficiency are very similar to B12, B12 also has these added neurological symptoms. And this is from demyelination, degeneration of the dorsal column, the corticospinal, and spinal cerebellar tracts. And so just to review your neuroanatomy here, here's a cross-section of the spinal cord. So the corticospinal tracts are shown here, and these are the motor tracts. So these are what, you know, it's in the name cortico from the cortex to the spine and then out, out to the peripheral nerves. So these are what innervate muscles and carry out movement. And then you'll also have the dorsal column, which is this section here on this side, and then also over here as well. And these are responsible for proprioception. So vibration and position sense. And so you have degeneration of the dorsal columns as well. And then the last thing here are the spinal cerebellar tracts. And it's, you remember it's in the name from the spine to cerebellum. And then this track is involved with coordination and balance. So clinically, you're going to see neurological symptoms, and that's going to include paresthesia, weakness, ataxia, abnormal gait, and then loss of touch and proprioception. And that all leads back to this degeneration that's occurring in these spinal tracts because of B12 deficiency. So vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid, is found in citrus fruits and vegetables pathways it's involved in is the major one is collagen synthesis. It's also involved in neurotransmitter synthesis and then iron absorption. And specifically, it helps absorb iron by converting it into its absorbable state, which would be the ferrous state or Fe2+, converting it from the ferric state. So ferric to ferrous. 
It also acts as an antioxidant, and then it's required for dopamine hydroxylase enzymes specifically. And then also in collagen synthesis, it's specifically required for hydroxylation of proline and lysine residues. And remember, we talked about that during the collagen synthesis lecture. If you have a deficiency of vitamin C, you're going to have a weaker immunity, and then you're also at risk for developing scurvy. Clinical features of that are anemia, delayed poor wound healing, petechiae on the skin, puffy gums, corkscrew hair, and hemorrhages. And really all of these symptoms are due to poor collagen synthesis. So if you can't produce collagen, it's going to produce this variety of symptoms. You're also going to have increased bleeding time on your labs, but normal prothrombin time. If you have an excess of vitamin C, you're at risk for developing renal stones, specifically calcium oxalate. And then you're also going to have generalized symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Lastly here, for zinc, its function is necessary for many zinc-requiring enzymes, so it acts as a cofactor, like many of these other vitamins. It's also involved in zinc fingers, which are those DNA-binding proteins. If you have a deficiency, it has a variety of unique clinical features. It's a loss of the ability to taste, to smell, poor delayed wound healing, hypogonadism, decreased hair, and then acrodermatitis enteropathica. All right, so that closes out our discussion of water-soluble vitamins and closes out our entire discussion of vitamins in general.